Excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, you know, my name is Mark Dynan. I'm an East Palo Alto resident. I help run the Facebook group East Palo Alto Neighbors and a few other sites. I've been concerned about the smoke that we've been breathing in during the recent outbreak of wildfires in Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, beyond wildfires, um, we have issues of pollution from heavy traffic that flows from East Palo Alto, flows through East Palo Alto between the 101 and Dumbarton Bridge. Fireworks, the nearby Palo Alto Airport, and the future construction activity at multiple local sites. Knowing the quality of the air that we breathe is important to me and my family and will often dictate what we do in any given day. Smoky days mean we'll spend time inside. Clean air means we'll be biking, walking, and doing other outdoor activities that we take for living granted. We take for granted living in the Bay Area. Other families have even graver concerns about air quality due to asthma and other lung ailments, which dramatically affect are dramatically affected by levels of air pollution. I became interested in purple air sensors when I heard them mentioned in the news uh, story. I was surprised to see that both East Palo Alto and Bell Haven in Menlo Park do not have any air quality sensors installed, despite there being hundreds in Palo Alto and Menlo Park. Our AQI index, in fact, comes from a sensor in Redwood City and does not reflect local conditions in East Palo Alto. Air pollution can be extremely localized, and knowing what the air quality is in Redwood City does not necessarily help residents of EPA. Sustainable Silicon Valley has extensive experience in air quality measurement and has mounted air quality sensors previously in East Palo Alto. Sustainable Silicon Valley has deep experience working with uh, purple air sensors, and today will give us an overview of how air quality sensors work, best practices regarding mounting, placement, and maintenance of purple air devices, and a general over, overview of air quality in East Palo Alto based on past measurements. With that, I'll pass it over to the team at Sustainable Silicon Valley. Uh, Jennifer Thompson is the Executive Director of Sustainable Silicon Valley, and we'll take things from here. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Thompson, the Executive Director of Sustainable Silicon Valley. SSV is a 20-year-old nonprofit focused on water, energy, mobility, air quality, and living a equitable and sustainable life in a decarbonizing Bay Area. This graphic here illustrates how a two degree difference could shave off the most dire impacts of climate change. SSV has been working in East Palo Alto for over six years. Our first big project in the community was facilitating the installation of solar on the warehouse building at the Ecumenical Hunger Program. We followed that up with a number of residential energy efficiency programs funded by the Air District. And most recently, we completed the Smart TA Traffic Analytics Project, project which correlated uh, traffic and air quality and for that, we uh, worked with a number of local partners, including the city of East Palo Alto, the YMCA, the fire station, uh, Yucca, Green Action, and St. Francis uh, Church, just to, say, just to name some. SSV is donating our time today because we've been working on air quality in East Palo Alto. Air quality monitoring is SSV's chief scientist Dr. Anthony Strava's specialty. And as an organization, SSV is open to sharing our expertise. Thank you, Tony and SSV staff for volunteering your time today. With that, I'd like to turn it over to SSV's water director and unofficial uh, Zoom master, Dennis Murphy, uh, for some basic housekeeping. And then uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Tony Strava. Hello, everybody. Um, Oops, I went wrong way. I'm uh, Dennis Murphy from, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, from Sustainable Silicon Valley. Um, one uh, quick thing uh, is something I've uh, been working on, uh, one of a very badly kept secret called Sustainable Life. Um, we do, uh, as, you know, as you'll see, we do a lot of things in air quality and water policy. Uh, and this is kind of, um, I was saying with sustainable life, this time it's personal. It's, it's basically everything else in terms of uh, living your best uh, and uh, your best sustainable life. So, um, sorry, I'm screwing up my uh, slide thing here, but uh, 
the uh, anyway, just a couple notes about housekeeping. Um, we anticipate a number of questions. Uh, best place for that is the Q and A. Second best is the chat. Um, if the thoughts occur, uh, you might see a poll. Um, but um, basically, the just wanted to mention those uh, areas for questions. I see some of you have found the the chat box as well. It, it is uh, open, I think, to chat to um, everyone or to panelists. Uh, so have at it. And then, of course, the Q and A is uh, the first place we'll look for when we uh, do go for questions. Um, I see people still coming in, and uh, so welcome and. Uh, Let's uh, go to it. Uh, send it over to Tony Strawa, and he's going to uh, take take the screen and move it from there. Take it away, Tony. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Mark and Dennis and Jennifer, for that those introductions. Um, as Jennifer and Dennis said, I'm Tony Strava. I'm Chief Scientist at uh, Sustainable Silicon Valley. Um, and we have been uh, working in the East Palo Alto area for, uh, for a while. Uh, for the last year or so, we've been uh, doing a project called Smart TA. Um, and let me tell you, oh, a little bit about, about that and in order to kind of give you an idea of kind of the work we've been doing in East Palo Alto. So the motivation for this study uh, was that East Palo Alto youth and seniors have a higher incidence of respiratory illness than uh, members of the community in San Mateo County in general. And the, the feeling was that uh, East Palo Alto, where it's located, also has a lot of uh, flow through traffic, people going from the Dumbarton Bridge to Highway 101 and back and forth. Uh, and so uh, the question was whether or not this had anything to do with it. So our objective was to see if there was a link between traffic congestion and outdoor air quality. And so in order to do that, we located a couple of sensor suites uh, here's one at St. Francis Church. Uh, here's one at the uh, fire department uh, there on University Avenue. Uh, so these are suites that were composed of uh, air wind direction and, uh, and speed. Uh, this is uh, gas phase sensors. Uh, and then we have some particle sensors, purple airs. Uh, and same setup in the fire department. And then at the YMCA, we only had the purple air sensor. Now these sensor suites that you see over here, uh, we had to take a, a lot of care and extra, um, what is the word, uh, e extra um, care in order to mount these things. Typically, uh, purple airs, as we as we'll see later on, are fairly easy to mount. They're fairly lightweight in terms of uh, of what their um, uh, requirements are for maintenance and, and whatnot. So uh, let's talk about, uh, just briefly about our, uh, our, mess, our takeaway findings that we, we had from the Smart TA project. We were out there for four months, July, August, September, October, uh, and looking at traffic along the um, University Avenue and air quality along University Avenue. And we did find a correlation between traffic congestion and outdoor air quality. And you can see that in this chart over here. The air quality index for particulate matter is the red curve, and the blue curve is a measure of congestion. Uh, and you can see that you know, when congestion peaks during the morning commute, then peaks again for the afternoon commute, uh, indeed, the air quality kind of matches that. So there is definitely a correlation there. On the other hand, if we look at what the air quality index is for two months out of that, uh, just as I just took two months instead of all four because it's easier to see these charts, you see that the air quality is in the good range with an occasional spike into the moderate range. So even though there's a correlation between air quality and traffic congestion, the air quality in East Palo Alto seems to be relatively good. 
So, so what what does this mean in terms of well how to, how this relates to uh, respiratory illnesses? Well, you know, there's you know that, that there that's the fact, and um, does it, traffic congestion may or may not play a role in that. It might be that people are responding to more um, shorter duration uh, spikes in the air quality that EPA does not regulate. The averages you see here are daily averages, and that's what the EPA regulates. <clears throat> during a daily av a during a, a day, there might be spikes that you see where a polluting truck goes by, for instance, that kind of get uh, washed out when you do it, do an hour hourly average. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that there may be outside influences um, that lead to respiratory uh, illnesses, um, you know, indoor air pollution, um, other kind of industrial sources or something like that, people's work environment or things like that. Those things might be involved. So I think a follow-on in order to get to the bottom of why East Palo Alto residents have uh, more respiratory illness might be an epidemiology study that really goes around and tries to look at those, those factors in addition to some of the air quality measurements that we're making here. So with that, I will leave us the SMART TA project and start talking about uh, what's going on uh, with, the, with the project that, uh, that Mark is starting. <clears throat> so what's being measured? So one of the criteria pollutants, that's what the Environmental Protection Agency calls, it, uh, calls them, that the things that they monitor are particulates. They're also gas phase measurements that, that are uh, criteria pollutants, but we're gonna focus on particulates. Uh, PM 2.5 stands for particle mass for diameters less than 2.5 microns. PM 10 is partic particle mass for less than 10 microns. And these are the two key particle standards. And to give you a feel for what, what that looks like, this is a typical human hair, 50 to 70 microns in diameter. You can put five to seven PM 10 particles uh, in that diameter. And for each PM10 particle, you can put four PM2.5 particles in that diameter. So these are pretty darn small particles. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to be seeing with the naked eye. Uh, for, for reference, this is kind of the size of beach sand, a little bit larger than, the, um, uh, than, a, than a human hair. And why is this important? It's important because the smaller particles can get into your lungs. PM10 particles. Uh, are mostly trapped in your nose and in your throat and don't get into the lungs. But the PM2.5 particles and smaller can get into your lungs and get down into the alveoli of your lungs where the actual air oxygen is transferred to the bloodstream. And so that's how that can get into your blood. And so that's why these uh, are uh, an important pollutant that um, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency wants to monitor. Sources of particulates are their industrial sources, power plants, traffic, wood smoke, and cigarettes. There's some common uh, sources. And, and these are the particles that the Environmental Protection Agency measures and regulates. Okay? And that's also what the purple air measures. However, there's an important distinction. Purple air does not measure particle mass. The uh, instruments that the Air District and the and Environmental Protection Agency uses measure particle mass. The purple air does not. Here's a, oh, am I, there we go. So here's a schematic of what the inside of the purple air looks like. Uh, there's a little light, a LED that shines light into a sample volume where the particles are. These particles scatter that light and some of that scattered light is detected uh, and, re and registered. And so the purple air measures scattered light, not particle mass. And typically a calibration constant is used in order to convert the scattered light measurement into particle mass. That conversion depends on the size and the composition and the shape of the particles. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Uh, on the other hand, 
you know, purple errors may not be as accurate as what the Air District uses, but they are certainly easy to mount and, and maintenance is very, uh, very minimal. So we'll talk a little bit about that. How do, uh, what are the, what are the um, sensors really require? They require AC power, uh, Wi-Fi, and minimal maintenance. And I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second here and I'm going to um, show you a purple air sensor. Uh, so, so this is the purple air sensor. I've got one in my house over here. You can see how small it is. Uh, if you can look down the throat of that, you see these two blue boxes. And those two blue boxes are, are identical sensors that measure the, air, uh, the light scattering. Uh, you also see the little light flashing over there that indicates that the, the sensor is working. And communicating to the cloud. They have this nice little bracket that you can either use screws to mount it to something or uh, in a lot of times when we were using them we just used zip ties to, to tie them to something. So they're pretty easy. The other thing I'll point out is that for our sensors we can't quite see but we put a little bit of, um, of netting on here to try and keep the bigger bugs out. That's the biggest problem is that the bugs tend to crawl up in there and the, the, the and that counts for most of the maintenance that you want to do is kind of get in there and try and clean that stuff out. Okay, so we'll go back to uh, sharing now. <clears throat> okay, so here we see uh, a couple of different ways that people have mounted the sensors. It's best to have these things about 10 feet off the ground if that's possible. Uh, but you certainly want to have it away from obstructions, uh, trees or other structures that would inhibit airflow. Most airflow in East Palo Alto comes from the Northeast, so a Northeast spot would be the best place to mount them. You wouldn't want to put them on a Southeast spot or someplace where that's in a little alcove or something like that. That would not be a good place for mounting. You want to keep them away from other sources of pollution, such as your barbecue grill, cigarette smoke, a vehicle exhaust, or exhaust vents from your house. That can cause false readings uh, that don't really represent the air quality in, uh, in the area. Okay. Okay. So we mentioned that the purple air is not as accurate as the air district sensors, but there are other advantages. They're easy to mount and maintain, and they can give you a better idea of the local and temporal coverage uh, of what's happening with air quality. Let's take a look at the Purple Air map. So you can view this at purpleair.com, go to maps, <clears throat> zoom in on your, the location that you're interested in, and you can see, as Mark says, East Palo Alto, there's nothing there. Okay, And so he, his project is going to remedy that. And you can see all the other sensors are uh, along the San Mateo and Santa Clara County over here. Uh, and so there's a lot better spatial coverage of what's going on. As, uh, as uh, Mark said, Redwood City um, up here, uh, that sensor really does not give you a good idea of what the rest of the counties are, our uh, air quality is. Okay. The other thing is that you can set the air, uh, the um, averaging time of the purple air to as, as short as 10 minute averages, and that's really the default. And so it gives you an idea of more of the diurnal variation of what the air is doing, as opposed to the air now site. So here is the air now site, airnow.gov, and this is what the air district uses. Here is the sensor that determines the air quality for this entire region. And so it's located in downtown Redwood City, and it is usually an hourly average as opposed to a 10 minute average that you can set the purple air on. Okay. So <clears throat> moving on. Uh, so when you're looking at the data, it's important to keep certain things in mind as you're trying to interpret the results of what you're seeing. And particularly when you're trying to compare the results that the purple air sensor is giving you and what you're reading in the newspaper, 
and what you're looking at uh, at the Air Now site if you happen to use, if you happen to compare those things. So you realize that the purple air measures particle light scattering, not mass. But for most particles, particularly gas, traffic pollution, they're, they're pretty accurate. Uh, wood smoke, um, there is an appropriate filter that you can use uh, that will, uh, will help correct its readings. So if we go to the purple air site, you can choose PM. This right now we're looking at PM 2.5 air quality index. You can choose other factors. Uh, and then this box here usually says none. That means no correction factors are being applied to what the readings are from the sensor. But if, if you have a lot of wood smoke, like we've had over the last two weeks, you want to set this to LRAPA, which is a correction factor that was developed specifically to give the, um, the purple airs more accurate measurements in the presence of wood smoke. It can typically reduce these uh, values. You see 30 or 40 points on air quality index, which is pretty substantial. And particularly if you want to compare this with the Air Now site, that's really what you want to do in the presence of wood smoke. Uh, when comparing to the Air Now site or the Environmental Protection Agency, realize that the Environmental Protection Agency standard is 24 hour average and they also measure mass, not light scattering. And each pollutant has its own air quality index. And Air Now actually reports the largest of those. So let's go back at the Air Now site. You see that the monitors, you can select either ozone and PM. Ozone, PM, PM 2.5, PM 10, uh, and then the contours. Uh, so, uh, so if you have this selected for ozone and PM, the reading you see will be the highest air quality index for either ozone or PM, whichever is the largest. Okay? So that's important to know. Also realize that air now averages over an hour time frame, and sometimes they can be uh, two or three hours behind. So that's also another factor cons to consider when you're comparing these things. If you were to compare your, uh, the air quality index that you're reading from your purple air sensor with the newspaper, for instance, well, that's a 24 hour forecast for what's happening you know, in, in, in the day. So that's just the forecast, it's also a 24 hour average. So keep that in mind when you're comparing these things. So Air Now does hourly averages. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about air quality index because uh, most people aren't really all that familiar with it, even though it's reported in the newspaper. So each pollutant, gas phase or particle phase, has a separate air quality index. It's, the air quality index is kind of on a standard scale and the actual measurement is converted to an air quality index by a certain set of standards that, uh, that Air Now has comes up with. Zero to 50 AQI is considered good. 51 to 100 is moderate. 101 to 150 is unhealthy for sensitive groups, would be young children and elderly or people with uh, uh, other conditions. And then beyond that, you have unhealthy or hazardous air quality. Um, so the air quality index is a function of the pollutant type. Each of these has their own. Uh, the concentration, exposure time, uh, temperature, and whatever other pollutants are out there. So I mentioned that um, uh, the air quality index is usually the worst of ozone or particulate matter. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, so we've seen the sensor. We've talked a little bit about, about uh, air quality index. So I just want to emphasize that, you know, these are pretty easy uh, instruments to, uh, to set up and use. Um, interpretation, you just need to know a few things in order, in order to interpret them appropriately and, um, uh, and, and mounting them. Uh, keep a couple of things in mind. There should be very little uh, trouble you have in mounting these things. So thank you very much for your attention. And I think uh, we're, we're good for some Q&A right now.
Dennis, you're on mute. Am mouth's moving and no words coming out. Um, it's difficult so, to read those lips. So. Yeah. So I'll uh, if you can send the screen back or let's see. Oh yeah. Um, actually, this will be fine. Uh, so as far as uh, the Q and A, here's a first one about schools from Vivian. Um, why don't all East Palo Alto schools have air quality sensors installed? That's a good question. It's something you should probably take up with your your city officials. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and it's also um, you know as part of this, I went ahead and I got eleven of these purple air monitors and. Given the importance of air quality for kids in recess, and uh, I know at my, my son's school, um, they'll keep kids inside or outside depending on what the air quality is um, with the fires and such. Um, that I, I need to talk to some of the people at the school district to see about getting, um, you know, some of these air sensors installed on site. I mean, given that they are relatively easy to install and just need a Wi-Fi network to hook into, those would be very logical sites to have. And I also think it would be a really good project for kids um, in schools in East Palo Alto to be able to do science projects and things about air, air quality and, and start talking and thinking about this. Um, the issue of air quality is not gonna go away. It's not going to be something that suddenly magically gets better as we enter into more wildfires and more uh, climate change, I could see this being an issue that we're all taking more and more seriously, but I, I think that's a it's a really great point about looping in the schools. I've, I've already contacted uh, some of the charters and the people, um, you know, at the Ravenswood City School District as well. So hopefully we'll get some traction there. But again, this is just getting started. So um, you know, I, I hope we can work with the schools in getting these sensors installed. Okay. Um... Somewhat similar vein here. Um, uh, this is asked by an anonymous person. Um, who paid for the monitors in other cities like Palo Alto? And what is the history behind East Palo Alto not having any? Yeah, yeah so, so one thing I forgot to mention is that Purple Air is a company. They will sell uh, their sensors to individuals. And I would say that the vast majority of the sensors you see on the purple air map were purchased by individuals. Now, some cities have joined together to um, and and bought their own. I don't know what the percentage is, but um, uh, but that's it, that's something to keep in mind. That most of those sensors are are bought by individuals. Mark, you got anything to say to that? To add. Yeah, um, so I was in contact with Purple Air. They are a startup company based in, in Utah, and I, I was very unfamiliar with them, but um, I, it, these are private devices, and it's, it's a relatively new technology. They were kind enough to work with us in terms of giving us a discount as well as donating a device. Um, there's 11 on the way. Um, you know, the, the goal, I think, is to get these strategically placed throughout East Palo Alto so we can have... Um, you know, different data points in different parts of the city to, you know, see what, what air quality is looking like. Um, and, you know, just, this is probably just a starting point. I mean, these are $200 devices. It's not a, um, the, the air quality instrumentation in Redwood City is what, $150,000 of instruments, um, scientific instrumentation, I think, or, or something along those lines. Um, you know, so, when when I found out uh, about this, you know, instinct was just like, you know, let's get this thing going, let's get it started. Um, it certainly doesn't hurt to have multiple sensors in, in a similar location, given that um, you know people move, the devices might go bad at some point. Um, but uh, you know, the general idea as we're trying to figure this out is get the devices up and working, and kind of iterate and change based on experience. Figure out how to get them installed. And, and work with people around the, around the community. But it is, a, you know, Purple Air is a private organization. Um, so they are private devices, which in some ways is like kind of, um, it kind of, it kind of illustrates the equity gap between 
EPA and or East Palo Alto and you know Palo Alto Menlo Park, where people in East Palo Alto have not been out purchasing these devices and being on the cutting edge of air quality, even though we're more affected by these issues than Portola Valley, uh, most of the time at least. You know, I guess Portola Valley is considerably closer to wood smoke than we are. Uh, there's a question for Tony about, uh, can you say more about LARPA, which is the Lane County, Oregon Regional Air Protection Authority, for those keeping score of acronyms at home? When should it be turned on? So when there is uh, wood smoke, uh, forest fire smoke in the area, so certainly uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, when we've had all these uh, forest fires kind of ringing the, the San Francisco Bay Area, you'd certainly want to have those, those uh, uh, that uh, filter put on. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in normal circumstances, uh, in the absence of that kind of wood smoke, I don't think that's appropriate. I think you'd want to just go back to the regular setting. Mm -hmm. So for the 13 months out of the year that we have uh, wood smoke, use LARPA. Um, uh, another question, uh, well, how did you choose, and I, I guess this is a question for Mark, but I'll, I think for uh, Anthony as well. How did you choose purple air over the other air monitors? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, so there are a lot of low cost sensors out there and actually uh, South Coast Air Quality District in uh, Los Angeles has a facility where they where they run comparisons on, on these various devices and they publish reports and talk about how uh, these various devices are, are working and how accurate they are and whatnot. They do this for particulate low cost sensors as well as gas phase low cost sensors. And so the Purple Air uh, had a couple of advantages. When, when we decided to use them for the Smart TA project, they uh, were relatively accurate. Uh, they were e easy to use, a low power profile, they had a low physical presence, um, and, um, and it was also convenient that, they, that the data was loaded up to the cloud where we could access that. Uh, and also the maps that, you, that we were looking at, you can see those, those things on that map. So, so the combination of factors and the fact that uh, the South Coast Air District gave it fairly good ratings in terms of its accuracy were what drove us to, to elect those. Um, this is a question from uh, uh, Barrett Travis. Uh, are there publicly available studies or reports that show the higher rate of respiratory illnesses in East Palo Alto versus surrounding areas? So there's a report published by uh, someone from the county that talks about this discrepancy between the higher rates of respiratory illness in East Palo Alto and, um, and the rest of San Mateo County. And it was a study that was done by this particular person in San Mateo County. I don't know if it's published anywhere. Jennifer, do you know if that's published somewhere? I, I don't know if it's published somewhere. Um, I believe it's available online. Okay. So the other place, the other, uh, place to look for that kind of information. It's not exactly the same uh, information that you're looking for, but the um, California Air Resources Board has divided the, the city up into various, or not the city, has it, the state up into various zones. And they have identified uh, zones that have poor air, poor air quality. Uh, and so um, I can't remember the name of that site offhand, but I think if you go to the California Air Resources Board, you can you can find a link to that site uh, and um, and determine you know what how they've rated uh, various communities in California. Okay, um, uh, I guess another question for Tony from Court Skinner. Now it is wood smoke, but not always. What is the composition of these particles that we are measuring 
do we know? Yeah. Uh, so that's a that's a good question because the composition of the particles is very important. It determines uh, how well the the conversion uh, goes between uh, light scattering and particulate mass. But more importantly, um, the composition of these particles can contain toxins. And so if, if they do, then that's a more serious concern. And so it's important to know what the composition is. Uh, the Air District does measure the composition of these particles, and you can go to their site and you can look at what the, the information that they have there. Um, it, there's also a lag. What they do is they collect particles on a filter and then send the filters off to be, um, to be analyzed in order to get the compositional information. Uh, so there's a little bit of a lag there, but, it can, but you can get an infor, in some information. So the problem with wildfires is that they not only burn wood, but they burn structures, they burn roads, they burn all kinds of stuff that can put toxic pollutants into the air. So what, what it, what's the composition of the stuff that we were breathing over the last couple of, of weeks, I can't tell you. Probably in another few weeks, we'll have information from the, um, the air district that would tell us what the composition was. Uh, question from Mark. Uh, can you tell us about what you have planned for the project moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, right now, uh, I've ordered 11 monitors, uh, 11 purple air devices. Right now, we're looking for places to put them. Um, I've been reaching out to people, um, generally homeowners, who have um, the ability to screw stuff into the outside of their house and have a Wi-Fi connection. Um, we're just getting started with that. I'd encourage anybody who's interested to you know, connect with me directly. Um, uh, you know, to talk talk about that. We're also trying to raise money. Um, Court Skinner and his Computers for Everyone nonprofit, which is a 501c3, will be accepting donations if people want to donate to cover the costs, even if they can't. Um, I have one uh, on their house themselves. Um, so there's a variety of ways to do this. I mean, ideally, um, I heard from Purple Air that they should be uh, at my house by Friday or so. So hope, hopefully we'll get the uh, you know a few of these installed and up and running by the weekend and can start seeing what the the numbers look like in East Palo Alto and then I've got work to do um, and other you know contacting you know, different institutions to see if they want to have them installed so I think it was getting back to an earlier question it would be really cool to have um, devices at prominent locations like Cooling Landing um, in East Palo Alto uh, the various school sites and um, you know they're they're not hugely expensive. I think with the discount, they ran around 210 bucks each um, to get installed. But um, there's a lot of, um, I think for, it's going to be fairly, you know, easy for homeowners to say, yeah, I'm going to put this up. But it might be a little bit more difficult and bureaucratic to get schools and other institutions to agree to, to host them. Uh, but we do want to get this thing going. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're in wildfire season and it would be really useful for uh, to be able to check out the local readings on Purple Air site, which I think, um, getting back to an earlier question that, that Tony answered, one of the huge advantages of this site is that it is available on your phone on an app if you want to just check to see what air quality is. And I suspect most of the time we're, we're not going to be checking these numbers, but there'll be occasions and incidents that everybody's going to be um, really curious as to what the what the air quality is like in East Palo Alto, like for today, for instance, or maybe next week. But, you know, the other reason for getting this done is to establish a historical benchmark so that if, if there are changes happening, either due to construction, traffic, or some other environmental change that we're tracking it, and we can say, okay, you know, in 2020, it was, it was this, and in 2025, it's that, and we have some data. Right now, I don't think there's any data on East Palo Alto. So we can't say that, you know, what was the air quality like in EPA in, in, in 2005 versus today. So, um, you know, I, I think there's going to be an initial uh, blast forward and get these things installed. But long term, um, there's going to be a lot of um, need for getting more people involved and, you know, make this a community project because we're all going to benefit from knowing what the quality of our air is. And, and you know, I've been 
reaching out to a variety of people already, um, but we need to, I, I need to make more of an effort and be able to hopefully hand this off to another team of people to take care of it, um, you know, moving forward. Um, um, but yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, just keep in mind that this time last week, nobody uh, had was even aware of this going to happen. So it's going forward, I think, very quickly, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, this is it's good news that's going forward, quick, forward quickly. But um, if you haven't been contacted and you're interested, just reach out to me. I'll uh, I'll get back to you as soon as you know we can we can talk about how you can get involved. And if you if you're a homeowner or uh, you want to host a device, let me know. And uh, and, 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 uh, let me know. Mark, how do people do uh, for those keeping score at home once again? Uh, how how do people do that? They could email me. Um, would it be helpful for me to put my email on the um, Q and A? Um, and, or the chat, probably. Yeah, chat. Yeah, okay, I'll do that right now. Uh, or and, reach out uh, to me on Facebook um, if if you're okay. on Facebook. So in the Interim, uh, a couple more questions. Thanks for that there. I see the Gmail. Um, and uh, this, um, well, here's another question uh, from uh, Lila Mack. Do you know if, if those higher rates of respiratory illness are true of low income communities in general beyond East Palo Alto? I uh, don't have any information on that. And so I mentioned uh, a follow on to SMART TA might be an epidemiology study that might get into those kind of uh, uh, answers. Um, I guess it's not, well, it is technically a question. Pamela Jones had asked about that San Mateo County report if it could be found and posted. Um, what division or office in San Mateo County is that on? I, I don't recall. I think we will investigate that. And if we can post it, uh, we'll find someplace to post it on our website, SSV website. Is that well, sound reasonable? I, I can say that if uh, we do have that link, I can, I can email the people who are part of this uh, discussion. OK. Um, uh, Let's see. Um, okay, question from Mary Biswell, um, who thanks Tony for a great presentation. Um, do you think the outdoor air quality, actually this is a question about outdoor air quality impacting indoor air quality. Um, if you have purple air sensors installed indoors, uh, well, she's just asking about the correlation. All right, yeah, thanks for that question, Mary. That's a, that's a great question. So there's a lot of discussion about the difference between outdoor and indoor air quality. So one of the nice things about living in California is that we can keep our windows open. And so that means that there's typically not very much difference between the two. However, if you wanna keep your uh, windows closed, if you're fortunate enough to have air conditioning, or if you just close the house up or something like that, particularly in the wintertime, um, there are a couple of sources of indoor air pollution that are different from outdoor air pollution. The first is that, you know, houses leak, and so some of the outdoor air pollution gets inside. Every time you open the door, walk in, you're getting some of the stuff from the outside inside. Uh, the other thing is that there are plenty of sources of indoor air pollution. Many people don't realize that, you know, walking across a carpet can generate a lot of particles. Uh, cooking generates an awful lot of particles. If you have a gas stove, just the combustion process it not being complete will put particles in the air. In addition, you know, if you're frying some food, that additionally puts particles in the air. Uh, if, you're, if you have someone in the household who smokes, that can affect your indoor air quality. So to date, the federal government is, does not put any uh, restrictions or requirements or regulations on indoor air quality. It's all outdoor air quality. 
but I think particularly if you have a sensitive individual at your home, it's, it's important to think about this thing, th these things. You can go to the Environmental Protection Agency website, learn more about indoor air pollution and, uh, and ways, you know, what, there are, what the sources could be and how to kind of clean the air up by an air filter, keep the air filter on your furnace, uh, furnace going. So as, as a, a point, so, so what, when we had really bad air quality here with the forest fires, I don't have air conditioning, but I would run our furnace fan and I replaced the furnace fan filter and that did a really good job of cleaning things up. Thank you. I noticed that uh, Diane Bailey uh, was on the, is on the call and uh, sure enough, she had another question about indoor air. Um, have, uh, speaking of indoor air, have you thought about measuring methane leaks and pollution from gas stoves and appliances? You kind of answered that. I will send uh, contact information. Uh, she asked about that for Mark. And um, anyway, she just, uh, I guess there's more comments after that than questions. So um, Anyway, thanks for addressing the, the indoor air quality. And I do want to mention, as I mentioned earlier today, that on the uh, uh, Purple Air site, you can toggle, um, you can check the boxes uh, for outdoor sensors and indoor sensors as well. Um, right, so let me, let me uh, add to that, uh, Dennis. So um, I know for a fact that San Jose on their site have links to uh, various sources uh, of uh, where you, where you can find out what uh, what kind of pollutants um, the uh, your your kitchen stove puts out and things like that get get a, to get a feel for what's going on uh, and uh, the point Dennis made about indoor and outdoor air quality sensors on the purple air site just keep in mind that you know if if a reading looks off uh, that it could be that somebody did not um, record the location of their sensor pro properly okay uh, uh, another question from court skinner um, about the distribution of monitors uh, what is the best distribution uh, to get really useful information rather than just, quote, bragging, unquote, information at his site. Right. Well, I think it's important to have a fairly uniform distribution over the city. Um, you know, you want to have that um, uh, in it, over all uh, diverse communities that you have in East Palo Alto. So I think that's an important thing. Uh, so just a just a um, kind of a, a an evenly dispersed uh, uh, number of sensors and location of sensors throughout the city. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it looks like we're we're doing a, a bit of a last call on questions. Um, uh, I'll just. Uh, Oh, well, there was a question about installation um, from Lila Mack about involving um, other NGOs uh, like Nuestra Casa or Actera or El Concilio. Um, uh, but once again, I think Mark would, would say something about it's uh, less than a week um, uh, in, in, from concept to webinar. Um, so, uh, there hasn't been a, a huge amount of run-up time uh, and planning, but any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would add that um, definitely going to reach out to as many people as possible and get this get this in motion. Um, we just got this started. Um, I, I'd also give a shout out to Michelle Dare from the city of East Palo Alto who put um, us in touch and was incredibly useful um, in terms of, of um, you know, coordinating this. I don't know if she's on the call today. She may have lots of, she does lots for the city and might be involved in COVID testing. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, um, it's going very quickly. It sounds like there's a lot of interest right now in getting these sensors. Um, there might not be in a month. So we're going to try to uh, 
get this going while everybody's engaged and interested. Um, I think long term, it's going to be really important to get sensors on university near hotspots like one on one and university, especially for folks in the woodland departments. We've talked to the people who run woodland um, about getting sensors installed on the buildings there, and they've been, you know, Sand Hill's been very cooperative um, and are interested in participating. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work to do. Um, it's, it's a, I think it's a relatively small project in terms of getting this up and running, but um, we definitely, um, you know, Tony had said that around 10 sensors would be good, but I, you know, more than that certainly wouldn't hurt anything as long as they're installed correctly and would be giving accurate readings. So um, yeah, I mean, this isn't, um, this is not an impossible problem to solve and I hopefully will we'll get it going um, and you know, get the sensors in place um, very quickly. And, you know, within the, the, hopefully within the next two weeks, we'll have a lot of data about what the air quality is in East Palo Alto using purple air sensors. Uh, one other question from Lila Mack about North Fair Oaks, um, another area with no data. Um, uh, not sure how that fits in with uh, East Palo Alto if there's, or if there are other community groups there. Yeah, I, I can answer that. I think one of the things that, um, as I've, I've kind of, you know, thrown myself into this in the last few days, you realize that this is not a problem unique to East Palo Alto, that there's issues in Richmond and East Oakland. There's issues in, in you know, Fair Oaks and other places which may not have accurate air quality measurements. Now you can get probably good enough, you know, based on what surrounding communities have. But I think we really want to know if there's a if there's really bad air on the university corridor in East Palo Alto, people should be aware of that, and it shouldn't just be something that um, passes, you know, that we're 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 not not aware of, and maybe it's very localized within a few blocks in East Palo Alto. Um, that's good to know, and I'm sure that's true in Richmond and other communities around you know California and the United States around the world. Um, so. I think one of the things that's interesting about this is that it's not an impossible problem to solve and it can be very easily duplicated in other communities, um, you know, with either purple air sensors or some other low cost sensor to give, uh, you know, local communities accurate information on the air that they're breathing. Okay. Um, well, I think we've exhausted questions and uh, just wondered if any any final thoughts I, I would say to people in East Palo Alto and and you know Bellhaven um, certainly feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions we'll try to get this thing going as quickly as possible um, I've been talking to people at um, um, you know, Purple Air, and they've been very approachable and have answered a lot of questions. So, um, you know, if you want to get that going, it looks like uh, Jimmy um, from one of the Purple Air user group just said, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's in uh, Vallejo and they've been doing it for two years. So it's cool to see. Uh, Jimmy, I'd like to connect with you after this and, and kind of get your tips on how, how it's worked on for, for you guys. Um, you know, um, I, I'm new to this, and I'm sure there's going to be people who are going to be much better at it. So hopefully, I get the ball running, and and we can get these things going, and, and move on to other other issues, and just sort of take for granted that we always know what the air quality measurements are in East Palo Alto, and and, and work on other things. So, uh, you know, to fix it. Um, one other last question for for Tony, um, just in terms of the purple air sensors. Uh, they, besides um, the 2.5 uh, rating, I mean, they, they actually the measure a number of different things like even humidity and uh, um, temperature. Um, is there any other things you would recommend uh, somebody looking at? In terms of... Hmm? Uh, you, mean, you mean data from the purple air itself? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I assume, right. it's a pretty long list. Uh, uh, just right. wondered if there's anything uh, you'd point out in particular. Uh, yeah. So I think it's important to remember that there is a pretty long list of, of information that they have on the purple air site. But just keep in mind that they make a single measurement. And all the rest of that stuff is just 
just conversion factors that the assumptions that they've made on how to get from their scattering measurement to PM 2.5 to PM 10 to concentration to any of those things, they they just apply conversion factors. There's a single measurement. So I would take the rest of of that stuff with a grain of salt because it 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 really depends on how good that calibration, how good those those assumptions are, and frankly, that's not very transparent. So I think the most transparent thing, the stuff that um, that South Coast really hangs their hat on, is the PM two point five. So the other thing that I'll I'll mention is we talk. There was a question about disadvantaged communities. And so there is a site uh, that you can go to to look to see what, uh, the, what the government, the federal government or the state government uh, classifies as individual uh, disadvantaged communities. And these are communities that are economically as well as air quality disadvantaged. And the site is calepa.ca.gov slash ENV justice, environmental justice, ENV justice. So if you go to that site, you can, um, uh, you can find some information about that. And what I'll do if I can is post this in the chat uh, for everyone. Okay. And then uh, if you want to, you can copy that and take a look at that. And it'll give you some more information. Um, Okay. Well, great. We're just uh, coming up on our appointed hour. It is five o'clock somewhere. And uh, I guess um, if that's it with everybody, we will do that. Um, uh, we'll save, we'll save the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll try to send something out if we have a uh, San Mateo County, um, that one, uh, link about uh, San Mateo County and their report. If we find that, we'll uh, email that out. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and, and panelists and Tony and Mark, especially, uh, uh, well done, so. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, this has gone, come together so quickly and uh, really, really appreciate the technical guidance and the time and energy you guys have spent on this. Um, and uh, just very appreciative. It's going to be a huge asset for the community. It may not be, you know, the there's a lot going on right now in East Palo Alto between, you know, COVID-19, the, you know, rents, um, tsunami, you know, uh, evictions and, and things like that. So a lot of people have a lot of other issues on there that are super important right now, but air quality is, is extremely important. And uh, hopefully we can get this taken care of. And I really appreciate everybody from uh, Sustainable Silicon Valley taking the time to do this conference. We'll try to circulate this video with, among so people who couldn't make it live can actually watch it on repeat. But you know, thank you so much. Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you, Mark, for taking the initiative. Um, and thank you, Tony, for sharing your expertise and knowledge uh, about uh, air quality and sensors. And thank you, everyone, for joining uh, today's presentation. Take care, stay healthy right. and safe. Bye-bye.